This is the Land Bank Ocean Health Land Bank Board of Trustees meeting. At the moment, we have three board members, so we don't quite have a quorum, but we will go ahead and proceed with non-action items. And thank you to our board members who are here this, this afternoon. Um, as I'm reviewing our agenda, it looks like we have two potential action items that we would not be able to address without a quorum. Um, one of those is approval of minutes, and the other would be a development application further on in the agenda. And so we will we'll see where we're at moment by moment throughout the meeting. And if necessary, we'll hold action on those items for the for next month in September. And so um, going and our first action item is roll call and approval of meeting minutes. And again, we'll do roll call, but not meeting minute approval. And so I have K Monk Morgan, Wes Galen, Gary Schmidt, Jerome Castillo. Alex Ibarra, Marv Schellenberg, and Lucas Johnson. Thank you. And so with that, we'll go right on into our Sedgwick County tax sale update. Um, we are, we've been telling you for quite some time that a tax sale was anticipated in the late summer or early fall. And as we approach that time frame, we are seeing that um, parcels continue to be redeemed throughout Wichita and Sedgwick County. When the filing was first filed, we started with 436 properties in Sedgwick County as a whole. And as of the August 8th report, there are 103 unredeemed properties in Wichita, and I believe approximately 130 in Sedgwick County as a whole. We've also been monitoring properties on the tax sale within a two mile focus or two miles, two square mile focus area that the land bank has identified to really look at and monitor for potential property acquisition. And at this point, about half of those have been redeemed, half remain unredeemed. Um, one thing, I, I haven't shown the map that we developed and have maintained at every meeting, but as I was looking at the map, um, I noticed that really in seeing some trends in terms of areas where properties remain unredeemed. And so I did want to show that map again today. It also aligns with maps that are publicly available on the Cedric County tax sales site. So again, this is this map is Wichita properties as a whole, but in looking, our um, focus area for the Wichita Land Bank are the two square miles, um, 17th Street on the north, 9th Street on the south, Grove and Hillside on the east and west, and you can see a pretty heavy concentration of properties that have not yet been redeemed on the tax sale in that area. Furthermore, if we zoom out, notice kind of a a scattering of properties throughout the city, but again, a heavy emphasis starting with the Northeast neighborhoods, kind of curving through downtown and curving back toward the Southeast in areas that we also know are economically challenged. And so I think as we look at where this project can go, um, any other potential areas that we really want to um, direct our work toward intentionally, that map is a great guide to say that after um, almost a year that this case has been proceeding, these are the areas where we're seeing that properties are not being redeemed for a variety of different reasons. And so we did receive official word actually just yesterday that the Cedric County tax sale date has been set. Um, that sale date will be September 6, 2023. I believe that's a Wednesday, first Wednesday in September. Um, this tax sale will be online again using Civic Source, which was the platform used last year. Uh, registration for the sale will take place between August 22nd and September 5th. One of the things that staff have really looked into and hoped to be able to identify was a way to meaningfully participate in the tax sale. And as of this point, we have not found a way to do so that doesn't involve fully participating with full outlay of land bank funds that then goes through the tax sale payoff process, um, paying off the tax sale, paying off taxing entities. And so at this point in time, we do not recommend trying to participate in this sale, but rather we would choose to monitor the sale again and to provide analysis of some of those outcomes. We did similar in December of last year, and coming out of that sale, we were able to look at parcels the board had really previously looked at ahead of sale and to look at, you know, were the delinquent taxes and fees able to be paid off in many cases 
the answer was no. And so we are continuing to look at that. We would recommend that that's how we would proceed with this sale. Um, at the moment, to participate fully would probably require the board to identify parcels and funding limits for staff to bid with. And that is a labor intensive process that doesn't play well in terms of open bidding. Absolutely. Of, of those items that went up for sale in December, how many of them remain open? Are there, are there repeats on this list? I don't know yet from the December properties, but that actually gets into another project that we're working on, um, looking at a 10-year data sample and how many times different parcels have repeated. And so to give a little preview of a future item, it's our hope that we'll have that data process or project complete and ready for presentation in September. We've done some early trend analysis and we're certainly seeing where parcels are cycling through multiple tax sales. We're seeing places where a parcel might be redeemed, but then show up again on the next tax sale, redeemed again and show up again. Um, so certainly there are patterns emerging of places that are vulnerable or places that are cycling. Hopefully we can get that information out ahead of time so we have a chance to review it. And yes. Yes. Any other questions on the tax sale updates? Okay. With that, we have um, on to item three, which is parcel updates. We have brought to the board a couple of times a potential donation at 1815 South Greenwood. And this one has been one that has really allowed us to kind of test our processes and, and systems. It's been slow moving for that reason. Um, but one thing that we were able to step back and try to do this in this past month was to analyze CDBG eligibility. Um, this parcel is a long row parcel with a dilapidated garage structure on it. And so something that we had looked into was, are we able to use community development block grant funds to do um, remediation, and then second, do we want to do that type of thing with a parcel that would ultimately be difficult to develop? And so I wanted to let Lance share a little bit about what he found regarding potential CDBG use for this, this particular property. Yes, we could we could obtain a lot with the, with the purpose of clearance of that structure as a spot blight uh, provision of the clearance. And then once that's done, uh, should be well below a $25,000 threshold, which uh, would affect our change of use. Since it's under that, we wouldn't be under any restrictions as far as disposal of the property. So we could you know, either give it to a neighbor or sell it, you know, for, for uh, development or, or whatever. So who owns that property now? Do you know? Um, we do have an, an owner's name. I don't have it right in front of me at the moment. Does the owner of that property own any property adjacent to it? No. Um, the circumstances behind this one, this has been a proposed donation to the land bank. Um, the owner actually purchased it off of tax sale, believing they were purchasing the lot next door that had a house on it. Uh, over time, I think they've had it, I don't have it right in front of me, but about eight or ten years at this point in time. And again, it's just kind of sat and become more and more of an eyesore over that time. So the owner had reached out to us with basically an offer of whether we would want it to be a donation. One of the sensitive areas is they also had requested that we don't reach out to the adjacent property owner. And so staff have not yet done that, but we recognize that that will be a necessary final step before making a final recommendation. Um, so my understanding is that potentially the property next door is a rental, but it's currently being maintained by an owner of the next door property because they believe they own this one. So there are some ownership questions that as we reach out may become a bit of a hornet's nest. So, so far we have kind of, we've done administrative analysis rather than actually reaching out to the other entities who might be involved because we recognize that there may be some some surprises when we do. 
but ownership is clear. Yes. In spite of the fact that they may be on. Yes. And so it was originally proposed to us wondering if we might be able to put kind of a shotgun or a tiny home style house. I believe it would require some variances to effectively do that. It is feasible, but in many ways, probably the simplest process with this would be to do abatement of the nuisance structure and then see if it could be disposed of as a side lot disposition. And so actually this kind of begs some questions of the board in terms of whether this is activity that you see as a primary activity for the land bank and a good use of funds and staff time, or whether this is not an activity that we want to pursue while we're still in formative phases. If not this group, who would, who, where would that land? Is there another entity that would take up my assumption would be most likely not short of the condemnation process. And so that is a true consideration is we do have the opportunity to go in, remove spotlight in a neighborhood that otherwise is, uh, we looked at surrounding properties and they range from average to very poor, but skewed toward average within this particular neighborhood in terms of property condition. It's my only concern we're sort of put in a position of negotiating with the neighbor and negotiate because we're not supposed to contact them. I mean, that the simple solution would be to see if the neighbor wants to acquire that property or whatever the cost is. I'm not real excited about the CDBG funds to tear down a garage that doesn't provide any additional benefit to the community in way, shape, or form. So. I guess uh, unless we can contact the other owners of the properties next door, I don't know what benefit this has for us. Am I looking at this wrong? No. So I think that would be our next step to reach out and say the donation is still actively being considered, but to proceed, we need to be able to contact the neighbors. Is there a reason why they indicated no contact? Does that that person's maintaining the property and the owner doesn't want to maintain the property? That was our understanding. Uh, okay. And really with this project, we may get into some of those. Yeah, if I could say something, I'll contact the owner to see if we can get permission to speak to either one on your side. I mean, that, that's who's going to yeah. be interested in the property. And the only thing I can say is, you know, maybe they'd be willing to buy it for whatever cost to tear the garage down or they I guess they could always repurpose the garage and secure it to where it's possible. But sounds like we're getting in the middle of a isn't it one side is a south side to rental, north side is a property owner. It might be vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see the landlord wanting it, but possibly the homeowner might want it just for increased value. Mm -hmm. well, I'd say proceed on those bases, but I I'm sure we'll want to spend a whole lot of time on it. We will work to bring it ready for final determination next month with those questions answered and clarified, as well as vetting who the, if there was interest by an, an adjacent property owner. Additionally, um, last month we had done a first presentation of an opportunity that is a little outside of what we envisioned with the land bank, but has some really interesting and great possibilities. So we, the city has been approached about a potential donation of a multifamily residential property. At this point, we're not ready to provide clear identifiers for what property this would be. Um, but what we had shared with the board last month is that this is a former hotel that had been remodeled into apartments, I believe in approximately 2005. This site contains 23 units plus a laundry facility. It originally was renovated from a hotel into apartments through a multi-party partnership 
um, most of the affordability restrictions from that original conversion have been fulfilled. And at this point, most of the original partners have exited partnership for this property. One of the federal loans from that previous conversion carries a 40 or 50 year um, restrictive use on, or use restriction on the facility. And so there are still a few decades to go to fully fulfill those uses. Uh, the current property manager has, er, has inquired whether the city would be interested in acquiring the property. And so that was what we had shared with the board previously. Since that time, five staff members from Housing and Community Services, as well as several from MABCD, um, conducted a site visit and walkthrough on August 1st um, last week. So we had inspectors represented from both entities as well, and generally found that the buildings are solid, they're in good condition, although there are some capital maintenance needs that would need to be considered and accounted for. Um, our staff has also conducted preliminary environmental review work, and at this point, no major environmental concerns have been identified for the property. That includes looking at floodplain considerations, and the property is not in a floodplain. Um, noise levels have been determined to be right at the acceptable threshold limit, and so no mitigation would be required. And some surrounding areas have some long-term monitoring for active contamination in, in the ground, but there are no contaminants known in the groundwater on this particular site. So those are all considerations we have to vet to determine if a project like this was eligible for the CDBG funding source. So um, at this point, we've also requested operating financials from the current manager. Uh, we've done some preliminary evaluation of program options that we could assist with and strategies that we could use to meet the facility's needs to be able to retain this as long-term affordable housing in the city of Wichita. Um, likely strategies could include um, programs that had housing choice vouchers, which require long-term monitoring, and so those make it easy to, con to determine if the affordability restrictions are being met. We do have some other programs, um, and I'll share more on programs at a future meeting too, but some other programs that we could layer within that could really assist with this project comprehensively. Uh, the complex currently does have occupants, and as a land bank, we have tended to not want to acquire occupied properties, traditionally because that would be a single-family residence and we would be looking at evictions. In this case, we would not want to unhouse anybody and destabilize anybody's situation. And so at this point, we still have public housing as a department, and we have staff who have the skills and experience to maintain an occupied multifamily unit. And so as far as considerations go, right now we have that staffing. At this point in time, no potential end users have been sought. And so identifying potential end users would be part of staff's due diligence primary, or, um, prior to a final recommendation for acquisition. And so we bring this to you with updates, um, mostly just because as we're developing each type of strategy for the land bank, we want to hear the board's opinions and feedbacks on project possibilities that we could take on. And with that, I'd be glad to stand for any questions. So next steps, Sarah, I mean, do we put together a pro forma as to what it could do and, you know, what the cost would be to, to do the maintenance and the repair work and then what the value of the property would be after that, whether or not find an investor to do that or what what is the next steps on something like this? I'm actually, if you don't mind, gonna look at Sally for expertise that she's done more things like this than what I have. Thank you, Gary. You're spot on. That's what we're doing right now is we're evaluating the land use restrictions. We're getting the financials from the current owner to identify the potential cash flow. We're looking at those um, federal restrictions on rents to make sure that the property is going to cash flow. So we need all of that information before we're going to move forward with any type of action. So we're underway. Whether or not this is in the designated area or is this outside? It is not. It is still an area that needs 
Absolutely. Yes. And and we have such a need for voucher homes right now, voucher properties. Would be something I think well within our scope. One of the other things, and Sally's probably about to say what I was going to share. You got it. I'll take care of the details. Um, we shared with board last month. Um, this actually came to our attention right at the same time as we had made an announcement about department strategies to really tackle veteran homelessness. And so in many ways, it was a perfect segue to say, you know, these are units. They're primarily would be single units and would be a stretch to make them double units. Um, but with units that we could put vouchers in, it would be a fantastic piece of that puzzle toward alleviating veteran homelessness. Well, let's get a proposal put together and discuss it next meeting. And if any of that information can be shared beforehand, that'd be great. Yeah, I Thank you. So this was one of our items that was proposed as an action item. It can be a review item again, um, but one of the things that we're wanting to try to narrow down is what are we looking for in a development application? And so within the board packets, there is a proposed development application. Truly on the other side of approving this application, we can begin to market the properties the land bank currently holds at 9th and Ash Street. And so I wanted to share just a little bit about what's included in the application and to seek any additional feedback from the board on anything else that you would wish to include. I'm also looking at this application as a first pilot opportunity. It may be that as we would vet something coming off this application, we identify other things that we want to include in future projects. And so really we want to be comfortable with what we go forward with, but this is not a final product that we're wedded to for everything going forward either. And so within the development application, um, we kind of looked at it not really as a full request for qu um, qualifications or request for proposals, but more wanting to have enough components included to be able to thoroughly evalu evaluate proposals that we might receive and for the board to be very comfortable with where we go with those proposals. And so if you look at page one and page two, those items are mostly informative for potential developers. Page one um, takes a lot of text and outlines the purpose of the land bank and factors that will be considered in the disposition of properties. And I'm gonna, um, those factors include the intended or planned use of the property, the nature and identity of the intended transferee of the property, and also the impact of a property transfer on the short and long-term neighborhood and community development plans. And so as we as staff evaluate things, then we would come back with those as part of our evaluation framework for a proposal. Page two um, outlines directly from the land bank admin policy, our neighborhood priorities and our property use priorities. And those are the same priorities we used in acquisition of these properties, really looking at potential intended use. And so we'll look at that again in the disposition process. Page three is really the heart of that application, and it outlines the information that staff will ensure is complete and that we'll review and analyze and bring back to you as the Land Bank Board of Trustees um, to make sure that, as, that you have the information that you want as final recommendations are made. And so that's actually where I wanted to pause and kind of focus attention and just to see what else you all might want to see within it. Um, since it was first presented, Kay had suggested adding a question about proposed entities experience working with particular neighborhoods or neighborhoods with similar demographics and compositions. And so that's been included on item three. And then at our previous month's meeting, um, board members also recommended that we clarify that the items uh, in number four, that if they're not applicable, that applicants would know that they don't have to answer every single item if it doesn't apply to that particular project. And so that's the text that's in red on this particular draft. And so again, this is the heart and the place that we really want to make sure that all the questions that need to be asked are being asked before we bring information to the board.
question I have on this is that the policies for residential land transfer are number one, the subject property must not have been used by the transferee or family member of the transferee, his or her personal residence at any time during the last 12 months. Explain that to me. Why, why is that a stipulation? Hmm. I have a property and I want to. I think you're actually on page four, which is the applicable policies surrounding transfers. Um, when the admin policy guide was created, it was actually a document that borrows what Jeff Van Zant found as best practices from around the country. And so this text was taken directly from that. Now, my anticipation and interpretation is that we probably don't want to be taking somebody's home out from under them. I'm not sure if that was actually the intent of this or not. Um, and I think Jeff has joined us online, so I don't know if he would be able to outline intent or if Sally or Logan would either one. Whether this is a development application, so whether or not I could take one of my own properties and apply for a development. That, mm -hmm. That's the thing I was thinking. Right. Is what's what I'm thinking too. Is they don't want someone who's you know four years behind in taxes going. I'm going to donate to this to the land bank, and then I'm going to come back in with a development agreement just to get the taxes wiped. If that's the case, I, that, I just try to get clarification. Absolutely. Yeah, that's my understanding of the intent of that as well. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, I'll ask another dumb question. No, that's okay. So is there any reason why we don't want to go ahead and proceed with uh, accepting any development applications on Ninth and Ash? Okay. Are we holding up to get this approved by the committee? Yes. We have to get that approved or can we go ahead and accept an application for review? I mean, all this is is a form as far as I'm concerned. We really should have our policy as to what we're going to consider for an application so that it is applied fairly across all future endeavors. I mean, that's. Yeah, well, don't we already have that basically in our packet of information we went over from Joe's for all. Yes, and a lot of that is a lot of this application is built directly from that. Really, the purpose of the packet as it was built was so that the applicable information is there for the developer all in one place. And so I just hate to have to hold up on accepting any applications because we don't have our form approved by this board. Is it possible to do have the form approved via email? Yeah. Again, I might. Um, looking to the ceiling because that's where Jeff's voice comes from. <laughs> I want to ask for Jeff to give us guidance on that. Could you repeat the question again? It kind of muffled when I couldn't hear it. Yes. Yeah, so basically, the question is that we have three board members, which is not a quorum, who can approve the application as it's um, drafted and proposed. And so the question is does the application need to be fully approved by the board? Or is it able to be um, distributed without board approval? The ideal would have board approval, but this is the second meeting we haven't had a quorum. And I, like I said, with uh, Gary's point, I don't want to hold anything up. Uh, the uh, document could be subject to amendment after the first time as, as we learn things anyway. So um, I think we've got a document that we could go forward on. Uh, the women, yeah. I'm sorry. With, you know, because we've had a, people look at it and they comment on it. So I think we could go forward on it, but we'd certainly like to have it approved at some point. Yeah, if, if we did it by email, would that be appropriate? Um. <laughs> No, that would that could violate the Open Meeting Act if we were conducting business outside of an open meeting. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and try again to approve it next time. Mm -hmm. But 
I don't see that this should hold up any uh, application if somebody wanted to put an application in. And I was going to say, based on what Jeff had said previously, with the board's blessing, we might be able to go ahead and distribute this so that at least potential applicants would have the preliminary text and be able to begin creating um, proposals, even subject to the final formal approval of the text. Would the board be comfortable with that? Okay, so we will begin to reach out to potential developers. Um, staff have been collecting a list of potential developers for a number of different projects that we have going on. And so we can send this information out to that whole list um, along with then we can resubmit to anyone who indicates interest. We can submit this as a, a working draft that will heavily reflect what we anticipate the final application will look like. Thank you. Okay. And then a preview of what's ahead. So as you know, um, we began looking at exhibits A and D from Cedric County tax sales um, early this year. And then we've had staff who have been assigned to multiple projects and staff capacity has been a challenge, but we are doubling down our efforts to finalize the analysis of both the exhibits A, which is the list of all parcels that have ended up in tax sale filings, and exhibit D, which is the distribution of final tax per, tax sale per, eh, proceeds. So basically, A captures every parcel that has gone through and D captures the parcels that have been sold and then shows where the money goes from there. Um, not to the level of detail of knowing which government entity receives how much, but we can see the payoff of the tax sale process. And then we can see kind of lump sum, whether it covered the delinquent taxes and interest from there. So that's as detailed as it gets. But what we are seeing so far, I've done some early test runs of our data set, and we are seeing that some parcels certainly do appear on multiple tax sales. We're also seeing the parcels that have been redeemed in one sale may later be sold. So somebody might come in and pay the furthest out year. So that gets it off that tax sale but they don't redeem it in full with all years paid up. And so it might be caught up again in the next tax sale or the next. We're seeing places where a parcel may have been sold in one tax sale and end up in a future one. We're seeing it where it may have been redeemed a couple of times and then sell. Um, that's just with a partial data set. So we're hoping to have some very strong analysis and charts and things like that that exemplify what we're seeing. Part of what makes this big is that we are looking at a 10-year data set. Um, we are, have a total of 21 filings within that, and each filing has several hundred sale or several hundred parcels within it. So we're trying to look as comprehensively as we can at a very, very large data set, but I think it's going to paint some very strong pictures of where the land bank might be able to do what the tax sale does not in terms of getting property back into productive use. Similarly, there's a second project underway. Um, the manager's office has created, or has had the creation of a map that shows permits that have been pulled, uh, especially within the past year under the, oh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, the name of the program, the urban infill, where permit fees would be waived in certain redevelopment areas, especially within the established central area. And so we are also working to cross the exhibit D data <clears throat> from a five-year sample, excuse me, um, over with that map to determine have permits been pulled in parcel on parcels that have been disposed of through tax sale? Are we actively seeing redevelopment use? And so we are going to have as much of these data pieces together for September as possible. I'm very, very excited about finally bringing that to the board. My only comment there, sir, is I would really like staff to come up with some recommendations based upon that data as to what we could do to uh, improve our community. Noted. Thank you. And then that actually feeds into our another update. And so we are working for um, the month of October 
trying to look at what does it really look like to put together a statute review and advocacy process for the land bank. We know that um, we've got two major hurdles that we've encountered with the land bank. The first one is that we see in other counties in Kansas, such as Crawford County, Wyandotte County, that those cities are able to participate in tax sale. And if a property does not sell for the delinquent amount of taxes and interest that is owed, it transfers to the land bank. Um, as we've discussed with Sedgwick County, interpretations between how we interpret that opportunity and how the I think I heard Jeff. OK, I'm sorry. Um, how we oh, yeah. interpret that versus how Sedgwick County interprets it are not aligning. And so we want to do everything that we can to find a way to bridge this um, so that we're not spending payer dollars on the city side, just paying off delinquent taxes on the Sedgwick County side, when really land banks should have the opportunity to wipe away those delinquent taxes and then steward properties back into productive use. So that's part of where we're looking at the tax sale question is that we're not convinced that those properties are back in productive use after being disposed of in tax sale. And so Jeff and I are gonna be your primary staff members working on this project. Um, Jeff is going to be working on the legal analysis of the statute and providing some bridge language that could be proposed legislatively to try to bridge what we're trying to do with what we're hearing that Sedgwick County says are their concerns. Um, because we, we do want to be good partners, but we also want to be successful. So I'm going to be looking at the past, the history of the land bank legislation. One of the things that we're hoping that we can identify is who was originally a sponsor of land bank legislation for the state of Kansas. If that person is still in the legislature or if others who helped to carry those projects are, then we want to reach out and we want to try to amend this place where we're not able to fully participate the way that we would like to as a land bank. And so within those, we want to identify concrete roadblocks and proposed solutions. And so that will be a whole staff effort um, between Jeff and I and also Lance and Roger, who are the program specialists. Um, from there, Jeff and I will be working to clarify where we need to advocate to see movement. Um, that could include with the county, that could include at the state level, that could include federal. And I think that's a place that we'll be asking for board members to leverage your connections and resources as well, because I think it's gonna take a lot of effort from a lot of angles to be able to move things forward. And so that will require continued coordination and supporting of those efforts likely testimony, likely producing documentation to show why this is a concern and what we're seeing are the consequences of not being able to successfully do this. And so we anticipate presenting that plan in October. Um, as far as um, advocacy platforms go, um, 2024, we're actually right on a little bit behind schedule for 2024. And so we're hoping that we can secure some coordination within the city and also as we develop opportunities and partnerships to be able to go ahead and still do meaningful work in 2024. And we also know that in Kansas, it's a very, very strong property rights state. Um, it's the environment that we're working within. And really the land bank, we want to be a last resort for when a property right begins to infringe on a neighbor's ability on, on the neighbor's neighborhoods um, ability to sustain at the level that they want to be. And so with that, I would be glad to answer any questions or seek further feedback on ideas. Full speed ahead. I mean, I, I think this is exactly what we need to do. I, I appreciate the fact now that you've established what our meeting is going to be about in September and October already. So staff now has a plan, an idea of what, what we need to come back with. And I think the board appreciates that too, because now we, we know what we're going to be talking about. We can do whatever homework we need to get up to speed on that. So I, I think it's very good, sir. Thank you. 
we know it's going to be challenging work, but also exciting to see if we can make momentum. Um, and I think the other thing that I didn't particularly outline within this one, but that we don't want to ignore, is that as a land bank, um, as a project, we are funded entirely with community development block grant funds. And so that's been the other major hurdle that we've identified. Because there are, as we outlined with some of the properties we're looking at, there are very specific things that we can and cannot do with those funds. And so staff is trying to creatively navigate within those parameters. But at the moment, there are some limitations on things that we cannot do with the funding that we think are probably going to be critical. And so um, that doesn't tie into this particular strain of advocacy, but it's an obstacle that we want to stay aware of and continue to work around to see what we can do successfully with this, with this project. Great topic. <laughs> Another thing I was going to wait till we get yeah open business, but I still think I would love for us to figure out how code enforcement uh, department here at the city could also work with the land bank, try to figure out how do we can improve neighborhoods and provide more options for landowners and the like. So that may be something we put on our agenda mm -hmm. forward. We've heard similar feedback as we've done community engagement as well, that the communities want to see that. They they want to maintain their communities and they want that assistance in that. I was going to say another thing um, that we would look at for a future meeting, just while we're talking future meeting business items and options, is it was suggested that um, the Housing and Community Services Department has a lot of different tools within its toolbox of different programs. And so that's something I would like to bring to the board in the future as well to talk about. The land bank is one of a series of tools and it has so many potential options of ways it can participate in affordable housing. But I'd love to share with the board some of the other options that we have available and how some of those tools can cross over to really be more effective than if they're used one at a time. Possibly, I mean, should we do that in a workshop as opposed to a board meeting? That that's just general information that I don't think open meeting laws would that could be a possibility. Um and I, I don't know if this board is aware of it. You're actually one of two boards that fall within the real property section um, that advise our work. We also recently activated the Affordable Housing Review Board. And so that might even be a good workshop to bring the boards together because the Affordable Housing Review Board is responsible for making recommendations within several of those programs, including our Housing Development Loan Program, our Affordable Housing Fund, and some other program options there too. Move Thank you. Um, so the one item that I knew of as far as other business and open discussion is that we've had a couple of requests to change our September meeting date. And so I wanted to bring to the board the possibility of moving it from September 13th to September 20th. One of the big issues there was this room was already open for 13. Yes, we had a conflicting request for the meeting room as well as um, became aware of somebody who wasn't going to be able to attend. Oh, that'd be a good one. Go ahead, plan. Okay. Well, thank you. So I will make sure that all entities are notified appropriately. It will also be posted on our website. Um, that proposed alternate date was posted within this agenda. And so we'll make sure that all notice is fulfilled that way. Are there other items for op um, other business or open discussion? Okay, would any, I guess, 
we're not technically meeting, but would the board like to indicate its consensus to adjourn? I would move to adjourn. Let's say. <laughs> Thank you. Say aye. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.